do put the pump close to the tank. You don't want a bunch of pressure drop on the suction side. Get that pump close to the cooling tower. Get that pump close to the condensate pump. Do provide adequate pipe sizes. Don't make pipe sizes too small between the pump suction and the cooling tower. We'll give you some guidelines in a minute. We want low velocities, not a time to be cutting back. Leave the suction line alone between the open system and the pump. Don't put three-way valves in there. Don't put fine mesh strainers. You don't want any excessive pressure drop between the cooling tower or the condensate pump and the pump because if you do, that reduces your available NPSH. Every time you have pressure drop, the available NPSH goes down, and that's bad. Never put strainers or valves in the suction line. You just don't want to do that because it's always added pressure drop. And again, any pressure drop in the suction piping reduces the available NPSH. And your whole guideline is you've got to keep the available NPSH greater than required. So you don't want to do anything that's going to reduce the available NPSH because that's bad. So don't put them in there. So somewhere in the suction piping, specifically with cooling towers, which are one of the major applications we get into, remember cooling towers aerate water. And that's what they do for a living. They, they take a thousand BTUs and they make it, you know, every pound of water and they take it out of the system and you've got water in the bottom of the cooling tower just full of air, about all the air can hold. Now, you've got to be careful with that because if you reduce the pressure slightly on the water, yes, you're reducing the available NPSH, but if you've got water full of air, the air is going to pop out too. So now you've got two issues going on in the cooling tower. Uh, on suction piping, and we'll take a look at it a little bit later, a little bit further. On the suction piping guidelines, and, and we like to have references. Here's a reference to ASHRAE handbook. It happens to be 1997, but it's not changed. The velocity exceeding 10 feet per second in suction piping is going to be noisy. That's, everybody kind of understand that. Look at what it says about branch lines. Branch lines. You've got multiple cells, multiple towers, multiple pieces of pipe. Actually, he's saying you probably should keep it uh, not to exceed five feet per second. That's pretty slow. That's a pretty, uh, pretty strong statement there. Uh, let's go over to HI, Hydraulic Institute. What does it say about suction pipe? HI, who every pump vendor I know in the world belongs to, so this is not Bell and Gossett saying this. This is everybody. Uh, with pipe velocities in the five to ten feet per second on suction piping, you got valves and fittings and so forth. You might need five to ten pipe diameters to straight pipe. No, we're kind of saying the same thing. They're saying if you get above five feet per second, you better pipe, you better start adding some straight pipe to make sure you don't get turbulence a lot of friction loss per HI. Uh, let's go back to my cooling tower we talked about a few minutes ago. Make sure you understand all this. A cooling tower hopefully is elevated. It's going to be full of water that's been airy. It's been full of air. And so if you've got air coming out of it, where is the air going to go in a piece of pipe? So first of all, in the piping, we want what kind of fittings? Eccentric fittings, but we don't want it piped as shown in this slide. We want it piped as shown in this particular slide. In other words, we want the flat part on the top because the air is going to collect at the top of it. If we trap it there, we're going to tear our pump up. We're going to get a slug of air and we're going to tear a pump up. This happens so often, it's unbelievable. You're going to get a slug of air and you're going to tear a pump up. Think about what happens between the coolant tower and the suction flange of the pump. If you have any kind of pressure drop at all below zero PSIG, then the air that's been in the aerated in the coolant tower is going to come out. That's not cavitation, that's air problem. But air sounds like cavitation. So one of the things you're going to have going on on coolant towers that's confusing to you is air will come out before you get an NPSH problem. And it sounds the same way. But you've got to understand you're pumping a liquid that's fully aerated, and if you put a slightly negative pressure on that liquid, the air is going to pop out. If the air pops out, it sounds like cavitation. So we've got to deal with those bubbles. We want the eccentric fittings flat on the top so we don't have that problem, and we want 5 to 10 pipe diameters of straight pipe based on the velocity you want to try to pump through that suction pipe. So here's kind of a summary of what we've already said to you, but I think it's pretty straightforward. You see the pipe dampers which have been recommended. You see where they're coming from. The eccentrics are there. Limit your reduces to one pipe size. Just make sure you understand that in suction pipe. If I've got a 10-inch connection coming out of my tower and I've got to reduce the pipe now, don't go from 10 to 6. Go from 10 to 8. One pipe size reduction at a time. 
really makes a huge difference. If you've got multiple pumps, slow the water down or try to use a tapered wire. If, you, if you're going to use straight branches, you've got to slow it down to five feet per second. Last but not least, you need some kind of a safety margin on your NPSH. What's reasonable? We asked Valen Gossett to give us a reasonable statement. This would apply to anybody, guys. This is nobody's particular pump. Anybody's pump would, would need some kind of a margin. You don't want to design your systems on the edge. So this is kind of a guideline recommendation that came from B&G. And you see the note left-hand column on cooling tower pumps. Remember, cooling towers have highly aerated water to deal with. So you've got air bubbles to deal with as well as worried about EMPSH. So cooling tower summary, this is one of the most common applications we have with the cooling tower. What are some good rules to make sure you don't have to worry? about NPSH on the cooling tower. Make sure that tower is above the pump. Get your liquid up above it because the more you elevate the sump of the cooling tower and the minimum level of the water in the cooling tower, the more you are adding to the available NPSH. That's good. Always bypass the sump if you're going to put a bypass. In this day and age, most people use two-way valves and modulate the flow. But if you're going to bypass, bypass to the sump. We would suggest that you not exceed five feet per second. Can you design it above that and make it work? Absolutely. But slow down if you're going to do that. Make sure you've got straight pipe. Make sure you've got a good pipe design if you're going to get above five feet per second. And that information is coming from HI and from ASHRAE and from BNG. Last but not least, we are recommending a safety margin. And you see the numbers we recommend. Don't go picking the required NPSH right on top of the, the available. Get yourself a safety margin to work with. So if you, what do you do if you've got high pressure drop in your piping? What do you do if the tower is 100 feet away from your pump? My suggestion is you need to go to a vertical turbine. If you've got long suction piping runs that's going to give you a lot of friction loss in your suction pipe, I would strongly recommend you go look at a vertical turbine application and get rid of that NPSH problem. You do not want to do that. You do not want your tower a long ways away from your pump. If you do, you're going to have a problem. So common sense, you've got high pressure drop in the friction side of your pump, you turn your suction pipe into your pump to your tower, go to vertical turbines and save a lot of problems. So let's go back and look at NPSH. We said the NPSH required comes from the pump then, that, that it's the pressure drop of the pump and they have to give you that. How do you think a pump vendor gets that information? They want to test, they put it in the lab. And they put a gauge on the suction plant, and they put all these pressures in there, and they measure the required NPSH of a pump. What kind of pipe do you think they're using? They're using a long straight pipe. It's probably stainless steel shiny pipe. It's probably two miles long. I'm going to the extreme, but my message is there's no valves in it. It's a piece of straight pipe. They want the best NPSH R curve they can get you. What happens? You come along and throw a short radius, short radius elbow on that. What have you done to that pump? If you come along and just slap a short bladed elbow on it, it's not the way we did it in the lab. So we cannot get the same results. You're going to hurt the pump performance as a minimum. You may create all kinds of problems. What should you do? Straight pipes, one answer, if you got the room. If you don't, good application for suction diffuser. In fact, that's why suction diffusers were invented. Suction diffusers have turning veins in them to turn that column of water in a very tight pattern into the eye of the pump and power in a smooth method to give you rated flow. In fact, b and will tell you if you take a suction diffuser on us and put it on our pump, we'll give you rated flow, rated capacity. You won't lose anything. How about on a double suction pump? I keep hearing that come up. Well, if the double suction pumps tested the same way. Nice long piece of straight pipe and the double suction pump, the whole, whole idea is you've got two sides to the impeller. You, you, you figure half your water is going to come through one side of the impeller, the other half to the other side of the impeller. It's called a double suction impeller. And by doing that, we reduce the, the loads on the bearings. We make the pump run real smooth, last a long time, you get longer life as long as you're doing that because we've got a balanced thrust load on the bearings coming from both sides. What happens when you pipe it like this? Same story again. You add a turbo to the suction side of the pump, you don't have a straight flow pattern, and you're going to overload one side of that pump impeller. 
you're going to overload one side. Now you're going to add thrust loads to the bands. Now, it depends on how bad you do this and how much trouble you get, but it's certainly not going to give you rated flow, and you certainly violated what you should be doing. Another reason to use suction diffusers on double suction pumps as well. Now, I hope you don't laugh at this slide, but sometimes we talk so much theory, I like you to see the real world. This is a real double suction pump application that we came across the other day, and I took a picture of it. It is a double suction pump We're on the suction side. And you see the eccentric fitting installed wrong way, right? What do you think is going to happen to that big bubble there? We're going to have air problems galore. And we had air problems. And I'm not going to tell you who this is, but have a little fun with this. We had air problems so severe, as you see the contractor went and put gauge tappings on there. To begin with, ladies and gentlemen, he put an automatic air vents on there. But guess what the problem was now? He had a vacuum. That's right. It's a cooling tower. We have a slight negative pressure, which is not unusual. You saw a cooling tower at Merle Beach on a negative one pound. You put an automatic vent on here, or you open a mega vent, what's going to happen? You're going to suck air and make it worse. In other words, this pump, that air bubble is going to tear that pump up. I, I bet you money we're going to have pump problems with seals and parings, and this pump's going to be a huge problem. That's why we documented it, because this is not right. And you see that air bubble is going to have the potential to destroy this pump. How do you like this? Now, if you've got an elbow to come into a suction of a double suction pump, if it's in the same, same plane with the impeller, okay, but not from the side. This is where we showed you a little while ago what was going to happen. We're going to overload one side of the impeller. We're going to add thrust loads to the bearings that should not be going on. This is not a good pump design. And again, I hope you understand why. Oh, I'm not through. How do you like this one? Well, I have never, I, don't even, I can't believe this one. And by the way, you see the check valves on the right hand pipe, so the suction's on the left hand side. You see how the suction wraps around, what is it, 180 degrees on the suction side? And it came out of an elbow 90, so it went 90 foot to 180. And you tell me this pump's going to perform? It ain't my fault. That's one of my famous sayings in my old age. But guys, we can't live with this. This pump's going to get torn up. It just doesn't make any sense. So, good answer on double suction pumps where you can and you've got tight space problems. Use a suction diffuser. Smooth out that flow. Let's get long, good life.